Welcome to the 100th episode of the Ink to Film podcast. Yes, welcome. This is going to be a more refined show going forward. We're going to speak in hushed tones now that we're 100 episodes in. Obviously, we're experts on all adaptations. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and name my favorite podcast title. Um, it's a good podcast, but my favorite title of a podcast is Our Opinions Are Correct. Uh, have you heard of this podcast? I have not, no. no this is uh, it's run by, uh, let's see, the hosts are Annalie Newitz, Newitz and Charlie Jane Anders. And uh, I just love the title of that podcast. Um, I'm sure it's tongue-in-cheek, and, and, but I think it's amazing because our opinions are now correct because we have, we have studied 100 episodes worth of adaptations and we are now the authority. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to get like an NPR voice going. But yeah, there I don't you know go, how well man. I succeeded. Yeah. Welcome to the. <laughs> I think it worked. Um, I mean, clearly, we we now know our stuff, and anything we say is gospel. <laughs> gospel. <laughs> um, man, I uh, I we also have a bottle of Blade Runner Scotch, uh, Blade Runner twenty forty nine Scotch that that was given to me by my brother, that I've been saving for a special occasion. And this is like, this is it, man. This is our special occasion. Why aren't you here so we can drink this thing together? Yeah, I know. A hundred episodes. <laughs> It'd be the, it's the best time. Um, but unfortunately, we can't. So I guess it'll sit there and maybe our 200th episode will we'll be together. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, man. Uh, thank, thanks, everybody. Seriously, though. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening for this long. And and our goal today is going to be to answer some questions. We, we sent out our questions to our listeners um, we have three big questions. One is, what's an adaptation you're looking forward to? One is, what's a book that you think would make for a great adaptation? And the other one, which is probably the title of this episode, is like, what's your favorite adaptation of all time? Or what's the best adaptation of all time? And we decided that we're going to try and tackle those questions along with our listeners who wrote in or who sent in recordings. So we're going to listen to their takes. We're going to give our own personal takes and then uh, discuss and I think that now that we've done 100 episodes, like clearly we can settle this thing once and for all, right? Yeah, I, I wanted to <laughs> echo what you said. I wanted to say thank you to everybody for listening. Um, it's been a crazy ride. I can't believe we've made it to 100 episodes. It just feels like yesterday that we started with with it and now we're all the way here. Yeah. Uh, I'm really excited to hear what everybody sent in for recordings. We we I only listened to half of them. Luke listened to half of them so that we would be fresh. Uh, yeah. for half of them. So <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm excited to hear like what, what people are looking forward to. And, and I think that this is going to be a fun way to, to look forward to the future and, and look forward to a hundred more. And I'm just really thankful that, that everybody's allowed us to, to uh, play in your, in your ears for the past, what, two years, two, yeah. right at two years, actually. Yeah. Well, maybe this is your first time listening. And if so, uh, yeah. we have a lot of content for you to, to enjoy, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, now that we've hit a hundred episodes, uh, I think we it's time to start introducing some like catchphrases, right? Um, we, we've got yeah. recurring memes from the show. Um, mm-hmm. I know we have the "Would you do it?" that I think we've done like three times ever. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I don't know. What, do, you, do you have any ideas for 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 any of that kind of thing we could we could use going forward? Yeah, I've been workshopping this this catchphrase. It's it's, it's like bazinga. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm surprised no one's used that before. <laughs> Yeah. See if yeah. Uh, see if that catches on. Yeah, I think I might. I might. Yeah, I might have to start having. You know, like uh, that's a Luke lesson. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you know, because right. we we've done a hundred episodes now, so we've got to we've got to start coming up with these catchphrases, man, so people can quote us. Put it on a T-shirt. <laughs> I want you know how like newscasters sign off. Uh-huh. I want something like that that we can sign off with, like. Um, it makes me think of like a Bruce Almighty where he's like, and that's how the cookie crumbles. There like I want go. something like that yeah. that we can drop. We, we need to come up with a good one of those. Unfortunately, I, I can't think of one right now, but <laughs> <laughs> if you come up with one by the end of this episode, man, it laid on me. Uh, oh, that yeah, would be I'll good. Try. Well, yeah, man, I, I'm ready to get into this feedback we got. Um, this is, this is obviously going to be kind of a relaxed episode. If you can't already tell um, one of that, that, which actually brings me back to one of the things that, I was thinking about with this show and that's um, that there's certain things that over time have sort of become, you know, all joking aside, like have become sort of the hallmarks of our show that I, that I sort of stand by and like, this is what we do. And one of the things that I think I pride myself on is staying focused on topic. 
And yeah, we go on little tangents here and there, but usually it's at least somewhat related to the topic at hand. We don't usually indulge in like big conversations about what we did over the weekend or, you know, that kind of stuff. And not not to shit on any podcasts that do that, um, if that's your show. But like, I feel like our show isn't that. And so one of the things I pride myself on is sort of like staying on topic like that, you know? Um, right. So so to break that mold, we're, we're not going to do that today. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, we're still going to stay somewhat on topic. But yeah, I mean, today today is 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 definitely an aberration as far as like the kind of episodes we do. Um, you can definitely look forward to us getting right back on schedule after this. We're going to be doing Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark is our next project. Um, we'll be focusing on that. We're going to be see the new movie, read the book and, and compare the two. Um, and then I know we have a couple big things that coming up later this year, we got two Stephen King things. We got it chapter two, we got Dr. Sleep, um, uh, which I know we're going to do. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff to look forward to coming this year. Yeah. I think going forward, using this hundredth episode as like a landmark, we're going to, we're going to moving forward. We might, we might, uh, like try out some new experimental things here and there. Yeah. And see how they go. Yeah, maybe maybe that's playing with the way we do our introductions. Maybe that's playing with the format in some fashion. Little things here and there as we try and just like really figure out what the best version of our show is. And that's the goal, right? To give you the best version of the product that we can put out. Um, and we're, we're definitely going to be reaching out to our council for each one of these things uh, on Facebook Council of Inklings group um, for feedback on this kind of stuff and and trying to figure out uh, little, little tweaks we might make here and there. But... Anyway, that's all shop talk. I think, uh, I think so. So my idea for why I ask the listeners these questions and why I think it'll be interesting for us to talk about them. And I want to know if you have the same experience. Um, whenever I tell people that I do a podcast on adaptations, I tend to get a version of one of these questions, right? Like that tends to be the thing that people hit me with. It's like, Oh yeah, what is there any like really cool adaptations coming up that like maybe they don't know about, right? Because they assume that I know a lot about them, and usually I do have an answer for that, and there are some. Or it's like, uh, what 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 books have you read that you think would be a good adaptation? Like that's probably something you have an opinion about now that you've done so many of them. And so I usually try and come up with an answer for that. And then the last one, and 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 really, it's like multiple forms. Is what's your favorite adaptation or that you've ever covered or what's a, a movie that was better than the book? Like, I think that's like a fun one. A lot of people like throw at me too. Right. Um, which is kind of a similar, but a little different sort of question. And I think, uh, for this episode, I think it'd be fun to try and tackle a lot of those, um, along with our listeners, because that's essentially what we asked them too, Right. So, so we can kind of, as a community, come up with some answers here and settle this thing once and for all. Right. <laughs> no one could ever argue yeah. with this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's funny, like people people do they're very opinionated about this stuff, right? Like people will be like, no, that was a bad adaptation. That was a good adaptation. Um, I think it's just fun to talk about adaptations, but I am ready to pick some pick some very specific ones here. You know, it's uh, a good thing you think it's fun to talk about adaptations because we've done a hundred yeah. episodes on. <laughs> was that what this was? A, this was a hundred of those on that? <laughs> it would be brutal if you were like, yeah, I really hate it. <laughs> It's you know so what? I, you know what I. You know what I've realized is I prefer films that are not adaptations. <laughs> Don't even blaspheme on this episode, James. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Clearly, they're the best of all films. Are all adapt adaptations? I won't hear otherwise. <laughs> well, all films are adapted from a screenplay, right? <laughs> uh, there you go. Um, yeah, man. So I'm ready to start playing some clips and talking about it. But before we do, we got to talk about this Patreon special offer that we have going right now. Um, this is this is an exciting thing that we're really hoping people latch on to. Um, all patrons of our podcast are going to get a token to our jukebox. You can use that token to put towards a project that you want us to cover. And they have a price associated with them. You get enough tokens to that project and it unlocks. Now, this this uh, jukebox list is on our website, by the way. You can find it. It's inktofilm.com forward slash jukebox, I believe, is the is the URL. And you can see the list. We can also add stuff to the list. It's not there. We haven't thought of everything. This is just the stuff that we've thought of that's on there that we haven't covered. Um, and yeah, that's the thing. Usually, this is a level that you have to pay a little more for, right? Because it's an exclusive level where you can control our content. But because we got to 100 episodes and we're, we're, we're thankful um, for the ability to do that, we wanted to give out a bunch of these tokens to our patrons at any level. So the lowest level is a $2 level. You get in, you get all of our bonus episodes, which we have 15 of them now, I think, up out. Um, so there's a lot of this bonus content. 
and um, including me reading one of my short stories. I forgot we did that as a bonus episode, actually. So that's in there. So that's kind of <laughs> cool. Um, if you're curious about that, I actually read one of my own short stories. Um, but yeah, you sign up for that and you're going to get a token. You just have to make sure you sign up by August 11th. So you're going to have only a few days after this episode goes live on Thursday. Yeah, I'm really excited to see what this influx of coin is going to do to the to the market here, to the uh, <laughs> yeah. crypto market. Yeah. But yeah, I am excited to see like what, what people put their coins on and what we're going to cover soon. Yeah. There was some discussion about maybe requesting a, a, a play that has been adapted into a film. Um, people are people are talking about some different stuff that I, I hope people put tokens towards. And, and maybe that forces us out of our comfort zone a little bit, but that could be good, you know? Um, maybe people request us to do a a romance, which I, we've been talking for a long time about doing, like we've done some stuff that has romance elements, but not like a pure romance. Right. So maybe we do one of those. Finally, people could vote for that. Um, it could be really cool. And and we hope that you consider joining, you know, if you've ever thought about supporting us, um, first off, that money goes a long way. It really helps us out. Uh, we have, we just actually, I, I noticed that our Squarespace is coming up for our website there was a big fee in there that every other year we've done this podcast, me and you have had to pitch in from our own pockets to pay for the website, right? Um, this right. time it was covered by our patrons. So that is really, really cool. We, we thank you guys so much for doing that. That's kind of the thing that this money is going towards, right? Like recurring costs um, and then and then our equipment, which is sort of falling apart at this point. Um, <laughs> a lot of it needs to be replaced and, and we're going to use that to replace it. So like that's what this money's going towards. You know what I mean? It really helps this show continue. We want to keep this thing going. Um, and, and so it's, you know, for two bucks, you can really help, help this thing out. But I don't know, man, anything else you want to add about that? I don't want to give you the hard sell. Also, I, and I, and I can't stress this enough. If you are not a patron and you just listen to this podcast, we love you just as much. Thank you for doing it. We know not everyone can afford to be a patron to things. It's a lot to ask. Um, so as I know we just gave you this like big sales pitch, but like, don't feel bad if you're not a patron and you, you can't do it right now. Like we totally understand and you're not any like less in our eyes or whatever. Um, we just want to put it out there for people who do have the means and are willing, right? That's what it's for. Right. Yeah. And like Luke was saying, it doesn't, just listening is, is enough for us. The fact that you like to to hear our opinions and listen to it, to it. And like, maybe you mention it, it to a friend, maybe you mention the podcast. Yeah. That's, that's plenty. And we would really appreciate it. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, you know, all joking aside from the top, like we know that our opinions are not (laughs) correct, right? (laughs) Pretty much by definition, they're, they're, they're just our opinions. Um, but we're, we're so glad that a lot of people have, have listened and, and felt that they're interesting enough to, to participate in. And that's one of the reasons we always, uh, invite feedback, right? Like we always want to hear the other side. So, uh, we're totally into that. And yeah, man, I, uh, speaking of hearing from our listeners, I think that's a good segue into, into playing our first clip if you're ready. Actually, wait, before we do, we're going to group these things. So this is this group. This group one is going to be our um, group of listeners who wrote in to say an adaptation that they're excited about. And what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to play those clips. We're going to we're going to talk about them and then we'll give our our picks right for this for this question and then we'll move on. Okay, so this is this is our group of uh, adaptations we're looking forward to. Let's play the first one. Hi everyone, it's Fonda Lee here to wish the Ink to Film podcast a happy 100th episode. An upcoming book to film adaptation that I am extremely excited for is the adaptation of Dune that is being directed by Denis Villeneuve and scheduled to be released at the end of 2020. Dune is one of my favorite classic epic science fiction novels, and I'm super excited to see what Villeneuve does with it, especially because I am such a huge fan of some of his films, including Sicario and Arrival and Blade Runner 2049. And the cast is shaping up to be this all-star ensemble, including actors like Josh Brolin and Dave Bautista and Jason Momoa and Javier Bardem. So I am very excited to see Dune on the big screen next year. All right, so that was Fonda Lee, who, by the way, her uh, second novel in uh, the Greenbone Saga series just came out, Jade War, sequel to Jade City, um, by the way. So definitely go pick that up. Awesome, awesome series. Um, but yeah, man, Dune, I am so excited for this too. I also want to mention that that Fonda was on our podcast. She was yeah. a guest actually at one point. She was oh, did on I not for say that? Sorry. <laughs> our Godfather coverage, which was incredible, and and what an adaptation that is. And yeah. if you're interested in that, 
uh, definitely go check that out. I, she joined us for three episodes, my... which is the the current record, I think, <laughs> for our guests. Yeah, uh, those were great. Definitely. So yeah, but yes, Dune. Yeah, She's man. Excited about Dune. I I could not be more excited about Dune. Yeah. Uh, totally that, I agree mean, with that. That cast is 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 forming up to be just unbelievable. Um, you know, the director, as she said, is just a, a le- like a legend right now. You, you know, he's fairly. I feel like he's fairly new, but he's 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 building this great filmography. Um, he's yeah, he's knocking it out of the park. You prompted me to to make a list of my top ten films, and uh, Uh-oh. he he was kind of floating around. He was like a, like as a, like a maybe as far as like some of his films here and there. Don't but reveal whether or not he enough, made it though, because I'm gonna I'm gonna have you build no. that list. No, yeah, I'm not going to tell you yet. Uh, okay. But basically, uh, th- there's a there's a trend in the type of films that I that I like, and they tend to be like massive, uh, epic, ad- like maybe adventure, maybe sci-fi type mm-hmm. films like that. And like this, this has just got my name written all over it. So I I couldn't be more excited for this. Yeah. So I have never read uh, Frank Herbert's novel. Um, I I know that it's like this classic of sci-fi and I am like, I want to read it so bad. Um, but I know that we're going to cover it. So we're going to, we're going to wait and we're going to read it right up against when that novel, when that movie comes out. Um, I know it's a big epic novel, so I'm really excited to get into it. I, I have seen the old adaptation, uh, of Dune. Um, but it was a long time ago. Have you, have you seen or read? Dune? I've never read, but I, I saw the original forever ago. I, I don't remember anything really about it. Yeah. Man, that's gonna be fun to revisit. I, I am, I am totally with Fonda there. Very excited for that one. Okay, so here's our next looking forward to adaptation. Hey guys, it's Grant from San Diego, California, and the adaptation I'm most looking forward to is the Watchmen series on HBO. I'm a fan of Lost and The Leftovers, so I'm excited to see where Damon Lindelof takes the story in the world of Watchmen. Uh, it looks like completely uncharted territory, so that'll be exciting. The The music is done by Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, so I can't wait to hear that. Uh, lots to look forward to. And finally, I just want to say thank you guys for the podcast and uh, keep up the great work. Thank you. So thank you to Grant for, for sending that in. We really appreciate that. As far as The Watchmen is concerned, like, Come on. It looks we talked yeah. about it in our bonus episode for the the San Diego Comic-Con 2019. Oh right. my god, it looks amazing. Um I, I like I'm a fan of the source material and I'm I I'm really interested like you are because it it doesn't seem like they're they're it does definitely seem like it's they're going somewhere different. And Grant mentioned uh Trent Reznor being part of the the you know, making the music for that show. I didn't realize that. Um that's awesome. 9 Inch Nails fame. Um, I'm a fan of his and, and, uh, I, I know that he scored, I think he's done score for a few other things. I know he did, uh, I think girl with the dragon tattoo, um, the Fincher, yeah. uh, version, which had a great score. So yeah, I'm excited to see what he'll do with that. Yeah. He's moved into that kind of that realm. I think he's been working with Fincher a lot recently. I think he worked on like the gone girl as well. Mm. Yeah. I so, can see that. So that's, it's cool that he was able to transition into like that, that kind of scoring. Yeah, it is cool. And, and yeah, thanks. Thanks for writing in Grant. I'm totally with you. So excited for Watchmen. I hope that's something we're going to be able to cover. Um, we talked about in our bonus episode, um, TV can be a little tricky to schedule. That's the only thing that worries me because if we can make it work for the schedule, I so want to cover it because I'm really into it, man. I'm definitely going to be watching. All right, let's get to the next one. Hi guys. This is Myla, uh, from Rockledge, Florida. I am very much looking forward to the adaptation for The Name of the Wind um, or The Kingkiller Chronicles, and I'm also really looking forward to the last book coming out. Um, Big fan of the program. Thank you guys for producing a quality show each week and providing us um, book and movie nerds with a great outlet. Um, Keep up the great work. You are very welcome, Myla, and thank you for for sending us that. I am also extremely excited for the Name of the Wind adaptation. Yeah, I, I've talked about it a few times now, but I was like halfway through Name of the Wind when we started this podcast, so I had to put it down because for the sake of the podcast, um, in case we covered it in the future, which mm-hmm. I'm hoping to. Uh, so honestly, I would love to be on that bandwagon with you guys and be like like shouting hooray <laughs> for it, but I don't yeah. I don't know all of it, so right. I'm really looking forward to it, and I've heard really good things though. Man, I, I'm excited for our coverage of it. Just you, you know, talking about it with you, and 
I think it's going to be fun. Um, the, 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 I don't know. If it's like, I heard that there's going to be a show and a movie and a video game. I'm not really sure what order these things are going to come out and if that's still true or if that's changed at all. I think that was still early on when things were being planned. I know Lin-Manuel Miranda is going to be involved in making the music for it, which is going to be incredible. Um, and then, yeah, she mentioned uh, excited for Doors of Stone to come out, which is the third book in that series. And I agree because I am a little worried that we're going to have another George R.R. R. Martin moment here because Rothfuss has been taking a very long time to finish this novel. Um, from what I understand, though, it's because he had some children and he wanted to sort of set aside um, a lot of time to spend with his children and not work as much on his writing. And um, they're starting to get a little older now. Maybe he's going to start writing more and maybe he'll get this thing done here soon. Um, you know, I, I, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt and think that he will. Maybe it'll come out around the time that they're getting started with this adaptation. Who knows? Um, it, it, I'm excited for it, though. Yeah, I agree. So since you since you're familiar with the material, how, like worst case scenario, how many seasons does he have to get that last book out? Oh, uh, like if it was if they were doing like a if, it, if they were doing like a Game of Thrones style adaptation, honestly, I think you could probably squeeze the first two books into maybe th- just like two or three seasons. Honestly, um, okay. you could maybe get three out of them. I, I would think that would be reasonable. But yeah, um, I mean, obviously, like like Name of the Wind is as long as a Game of Thrones, approximately. You know what I mean? So as far as length goes, there's a lot less of it in the series currently. Um, there's also some. There's also like a prequel novella, or, or I actually don't know if it was a prequel or not. There was called uh, "Slow Guard of Silent Things," which, by the way, if you haven't read and you're aching for more of that world, you could check it out. It's a little different, but it's um, it's an interesting read, and um, that could maybe play into something. They could do something with that. So I'll be curious to see actually if we see any sort of adaptation of that material. Um, but yeah, man, I, I'm excited for it, and uh, that's another good choice. All right, let's hear the next one. Hey Luke, hey James, this is Colton from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in the United States. I'm excited for the upcoming Watchmen adaptation coming later this year to HBO because I personally believe that the original graphic novel of Watchmen by Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons is one of, if not the greatest graphic novel of all time, Uh, and I'm really, really interested to see what Damon Lindelof does to adapt uh, that novel into a modernized setting while adding Uh, hopefully some unique twists uh, to the formula as well. Uh, So if you want to hear more uh, from me, uh, I host a podcast called Watch, Review, Repeat with my best friend Andrew Meadows where we talk about the latest in film and television. And uh, I can guarantee you we're going to be talking about some Watchmen on there. So uh, congrats, guys, on uh, episode 100. It's a huge, huge milestone. Love what you guys do. Keep up the great work. Yeah, man, another vote for Watchmen. Uh, Thank you to Colton for writing in. Uh, We were just on their podcast, actually, Watch, Review, Repeat. We talked about Stranger Things Season 3, if you want to check that out. We were on a recent episode. I think it was like 105 for them, Uh, which also reminds me, they just crossed 100 episodes. So, you know, mutual congratulations there, because they got started around the same time as us. Uh, but yeah, man, we've, we've already mentioned it here. Uh, I think Grant kind of, kind of, kind of got in there first, uh, with the, with the Watchmen, but yeah, we are excited for that one. If it's not already clear. Thanks to Colton again for sending that in and, and good luck to you guys and, and hope you're doing well. Maybe we'll see you back for, for Stranger Things 4. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what, if, uh, if, if for some reason we can't find a way to cover Watchmen, uh, maybe we can hop on their show and talk about it with them <laughs> just so we can yeah. talk, cover it in some fashion. Uh, but I think we'll probably yeah. find a way to do it. I suspect we will make it happen. We'll try. Okay. And the last one that was sent in that was about looking forward to an adaptation is going to start right now. Hello, Luke. Hello, James. This is Steven from Vieira, Florida. And in a world like we have today, I'm most looking forward to the 2020 adaptation of Dune. Growing up, I was a huge fan of the 1984 version, and I went back and I read the books. I couldn't believe that something so intricate and amazing could be brought to screen and that it could really show me the sandworm moving through the sand. I was awe-inspired, amazed. It was just the greatest experience growing up and really opened my mind to the possibilities of what can happen in an adaptation. I want to tell you guys that I think that your podcast is tremendous. I'm a longtime fan, and I'm actually a longtime supporter. I listen to it all the time while I'm working out, and it really gets me through my day and gives me something to look forward to towards the end of each week. 
I'm glad to hear that we're motivating for for working out. Yeah, like, I feel like definitely. I feel like now I need to, to give throw a little like you can do it. Keep it up. <laughs> one more. I need to throw that into episodes every once in a while. Yeah, one more rep. Uh, so yeah, Dune though. I mean, yeah, another vote for Dune. Uh, absolutely, and and you know that's true. Like it, it is so cool. Like the little kid in me agrees with that, right? Like reading a book and then and then watching a movie that captures something magical from that book. And puts it on screen or captures a scene that you just were didn't know how badly you wanted to see put on film like that's one of the coolest moments in an adaptation whenever you can get that feeling so i'm totally with you there steve and uh yeah i'm hoping that the new dune is able to just turn that up to 11 and and blow all of our minds i think it will i can't wait to read the the source material as well because because i'm assuming everybody said it's great so i'm really looking forward to to kind of getting that perspective on it All right, man. So that's all of our feedback for this particular question. But now it's time for us to weigh in. Uh, Let's alternate who goes first. Who who do you want to start this thing off? We're going to we're going to answer what what is an adaptation that we are excited for? Well, I'll go first. Um, I I'm changing mine because multiple people said mine. Uh, So I I was going to say Watchmen. Okay, yeah, I was going to say Watchmen, which I just I cannot wait for it. I think it looks incredible. But I, I do want to mention something that we talked about on our recent bonus episode. His Dark Materials really looks like it's going to it's gonna suck me in. Like, I, it just looks like my type of show. I'm really excited to see that. Yeah, man. I know very little about that. You said you've, you've read the book as well? No, I haven't. Oh, you haven't? Okay. So, but you saw the original Golden Compass movie. That's what it yeah, was. Yeah, I saw okay. the original movie. That's what it was. But this one looks a lot better. I mean, I haven't seen that, but I've, just from what I've heard, right? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about that in our most recent bonus. Right. And everybody, everybody that I know that said like, oh, I really liked, uh, I really liked the books, but unfortunately the golden compass just didn't quite live up. Everybody's getting excited. They're like this, this looks like it's the real version. So I I can't wait for that. Now my answer is interesting because not anybody here has said it yet, but for me, it is my current, like my current level of excitement is reaching like a crescendo. And so I'm going to choose this one because it's coming soon. And that is it chapter two. It is now, I think part of it is that this project holds a really special place for me because it was our first project. Right. And it's going to be so much fun to go back and revisit that. But I truly love that novel. And I love, and and I think um, it chapter one was, was a really, really good adaptation. Um, and, and this one too, from the early trailers just looks incredible. The performances are all fun. I think it's going to be a massive movie. I think it's going to make a ton of money and I'm really excited to revisit it. And, and I'm actually like already kind of sad for the moment that's going to come once we finish it and we put a cap on it because at that point, like we're probably not going to get another it adaptation for many a year and or maybe ever and we will have then come to the point where we're past it you know what i mean whereas right now right. we're still you know eagerly awaiting it and we're still having to feel that excitement for the next installment of the pennywise uh adaptation and man i'm just i'm i'm very into it i'm very excited i like that yeah it's always been there looming right as soon as we started the podcast we always knew that we were going to cover it chapter two it was always yeah. going to be there uh it's going to be bittersweet for sure and it was one of the things that really um like th- I remember seeing that trailer and thinking like, man, th- that that would be a podcast reading it because that's such a massive novel. And then talking about the ways that they're able to cram it into one movie, because at the time I was thinking it was just going to be one movie. And then later I learned it was going to be two. But still, I, I how massive that novel is. I knew that there was going to have to be a process of changing it. And so a lot of that went into the idea for this podcast, just just knowing that they were doing they were going to take on this thing. And yeah. yeah, for that reason, I'm extremely excited for it. I, I, I hope that a lot of our listeners are going to check out our episodes on it because I think it's going to be a uh, really interesting project for sure. I was listening to a podcast recently and I was surprised because they were talking about it chapter two and they were talking about how it was going to come out, it was going to make all this money. But then they were also saying that if it made a lot of money, there, there, there's definitely going to be an it chapter three. And I was like, absolutely not. Well, I was like, that, no way. That's why we do this podcast, man, because people don't know what they're saying. People go into this thing and they think that chapter two was just a money grab and they don't realize that it's part of the novel. Like it's literally half the novel that was left out of the first movie. They're not going to do a chapter three. Come on. No, no way. <laughs> um, all right, man. Uh, 
I am ready to get into this next section here. This is a cool section. So this is something that I do get asked sometimes. And I'm really curious to see what people wrote in uh, or, or sent us in um, for this one. And that's what is a book that you want to see adapted or you think that would make for a great adaptation. So let's go ahead and play the first one of those we got. Hi, Ink to Film listeners and Ink to Film hosts. This is Lindsay from 33% Pulp. And I would like to see Emily St. John Mandel's Station Eleven adapted into a movie. The book won the Arthur C. Clarke Award in 2015 and has legit unexpected twists that I think could play really well on screen. Actually, Wikipedia says Scott Steindorf, the guy who produced Love in the Time of Cholera and The Human Stain, is working on an adaptation, but I haven't seen any updates on it. So maybe you know more about that. The narrative itself contains a lot of diegetic transmedial references from Shakespeare, like King Lear, uh, to graphic novels and museum curation, oral history. There's a post-apocalyptic cult, a traveling symphony, a flu that kills everyone. What's not to like? So that is what I would like to see. Congrats on hitting episode 100. Keep it up. Thank you to Lindsay from 33% Pulp. Uh, we were actually on their podcast a while back now, but we, yeah. we covered Touch of Evil, which was, I love getting into like older films like that, like film noir. Uh, yeah. That was a lot of fun. And as far as this project is concerned, I, I'm not familiar with this novel, but it does sound like a lot of fun. You, you make it sound very enticing as far as like all the different, <laughs> uh, you know, all the different things that are threaded in there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I am aware of Station Eleven. This is a novel that has been that high up on my to be read list for a long time um it's also one of those that has been sort of buried because we've been doing this podcast and and i tend to focus on adaptations um i had also heard the same thing that she mentioned um about the adaptation but i went ahead and did some research um to find out what the current status is and there actually is an update here that i that i just found um but yeah i i agree with what she said that that uh, that this project seems to be very interesting. If it's if it's as she described, it is it in and of itself kind of about um, adaptation and preserving the past and changing form, and um, that's a really interesting subject matter for us, right? Like that seems like that's right down you know home plate for the kind of thing that we want to cover. So um, it sounds exciting. Let me tell you some of these new in, these new details. Now this is according to an article I'm seeing that came out on June 25th of this year. So this is this is you know pretty recent, only a couple months old now. Um, it's they're now saying that uh, Hiro Mirai, uh, known for the Atlanta TV show, am I saying that name correctly? Do you know? Uh, I'm not sure, but okay. Atlanta like the Donald Glover show. Yes, on FX. Um, okay, he's the director behind This Is America. Oh, okay. He he uh, some of the best episodes of Atlanta. He's not the showrunner, but he does some of the episodes. Right. He also did some episodes of Barry. I am familiar with him. Yeah, and so he's partnering with a writer named Patrick Somerville, who is actually best known for his writing in The Leftovers, another show that we really really like. Um, so they're they're partnering and they're doing a TV show adaptation for Station Eleven. It's being reported. So uh, that's really cool. Um, it seems like it is still early on, early goings here. So hopefully that this won't all fall apart. But um, that is that is a, an update to what I had heard too. So yeah, man, I'm excited for that. Um, absolutely. And I think that it's funny because it's like, it is happening. <laughs> so it's, 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 it is a book that deserves an adaptation. And it sounds like good news, it's happening. Um, and I'm into it for sure. That's awesome. I yeah, the, the creatives involved in that. I'm I'm down just to, no matter what form it comes out in, I'll check it out. Okay, let's get into the next clip. Hey guys, it's Ben in West Palm. Um, I just want to say keep up the great work. You guys have been killing it, covering a lot of my favorite films recently. For uh, adaptation suggestions, I think James may uh, I may have talked to him about this before. I want to say he read it when he was a kid. Also, um, it's called the Seventh Tower series. I call it the Seventh Tower Saga. I think it's called the Seventh Tower Series uh, by Garth Nix. Six books. They're all like really short, like 200 pages or so. I mean, I think I read it, um, came around around uh, 2000. But yeah, essentially it's just like this like um, perpetual nighttime planet. And there's like one mountain of people who kind of control like the light on the planet. And um, I think the, the, the protagonists are like 13 years old. And I think it's kind of like they're trying to become, they're trying to figure out what they're going to be as adults. 
um, and how they're going to fit in this society. But yeah, it's a cool blend of like sword and sorcery and a bunch of other stuff you can get into. But it actually might, uh, there might be some kind of a, an in with uh, an adaptation also, because according to the Wikipedia page, apparently it was a like a joint venture between Scholastic and Lucas Books, I guess, Lucas Film and Lucas Books. Basically, I guess George Lucas came up to Garth Nix and, and wanted him to do this series with like a, a kind of a premise that they kind of agreed to um and that's how the series started i guess he just cranked out these six books in like less than two years um but anyways look it up it's pretty cool and uh keep up the great work guys yeah i i have read these books um i remember reading them when i was so young that like i feel like a lot of it blends together but it was really captivating it was really interesting and and um there's like a class system like he was saying and and you know, it's got, there's like creatures and familiars and things like that. So I would like to see an adaptation of it. I remember, I really fondly remember, I should reread it so that I can be more clear on it. But I mean, Lucas, Lucasfilm being attached to it in some ways is, is pretty crazy. Like maybe I have heard weird stuff about George Lucas though. Like apparently because of, you know, a lot of things that went on with him as a filmmaker, he now just like makes films for him and himself, like mm. himself and his friends. And he, he just shoots things and, and like plays them in his own theater. And, weird. and I guess, yeah, I guess he's not really interested in necessarily like pursuing film for others anymore. It's like really for him. Um, wow. so hopefully he doesn't do that with this and he like, <laughs> yeah. somehow like is able to help them get an adaptation made. Share the love. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm into it, man. I, uh, Garth Nix, uh, I read Sabriel by Garth Nix and actually listened to the audiobook, which was narrated by Tim Curry. Um, and that's one of my early audiobook memories. It's actually a really good audiobook. I highly recommend it. And uh, I know I, I enjoyed that series a lot. It was a long time ago. I would be interested to revisit it. Um, I didn't know about uh, the other the other novels, so um, that's cool. I'm, that's exciting. That's a cool author. I'm, I'm definitely definitely into that. I and I, I agree. I think that should be adapted. I'm with you. Maybe Sabriel too. I think that would be a good one. <laughs> okay, so let's hear our next one. Hey guys, it's Mike Arns in here. Congratulations on your 100th episode. I just love the Ink to Film podcast and I really appreciated the time you had me on twice <laughs> to talk about John Carpenter's The Thing. Uh, you know, I've been thinking that I would love to see a book adaptation of a movie that was recently remade. Uh, it's Dario Argento's Suspiria, which recently was remade into a really classy movie uh, and has generated a lot of discussion among horror enthusiasts. But the story itself and the plot is very difficult to understand or even comprehend, even though it's a basic fairy tale about witches. I think that would make a, a fantastic novel. and That would be something I'd love to try to write someday, actually. It'd be a lot of fun. Fully co-signed by me. Uh, someone, someone pay Mike Arnzen to write the novel adaptation of Suspiria. Uh, I actually haven't seen the movies. Um, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say, cause I think that they're probably considered these big classics and I really need to watch them. Um, and by movies, I mean the original and the adaptation or, or sorry, the, the remake. Um, but yeah, man, I, I think you have seen them, right? Yeah, the like you said, it's the, the the original was really complicated to me. Like it was, there's a lot more going on than the actual story that's like at, at hand. It took me a couple of times to really to really get it. And but God, is it just like it's visually amazing and and just a, a great film. And then it was being remade, and I was excited for the remake, but also cautious. And mm -hmm. then the remake came out, and it was so weird and so different. And and like it, it, it's I don't know, it's it's really something fascinating to look at because it's this like rare remake that that isn't really similar to the original but in some way it is yeah um and yet it's still good in its own right i i yeah. those are really really interesting movies to watch especially together now that there's like you know that conversation to be had yeah. and man mike arnzen is a four-time bram Stoker award-winning author horror writer, horror writer um so i i mean you could do worse for someone to adapt it um, I'm all for it. And, uh, he was a guest, as he said, for the thing, which I look back at those episodes fondly. I uh, had a lot of fun having him on. He was also my mentor when I was at Seton Hill, um, learned a lot from him. He's a great guy. You should definitely read his books and, and, and follow him on Twitter and all that. <laughs> yeah. Those were great episodes. I loved having him on. He, yeah. I loved how we were able to dig into the thing and, yeah. and uh, he teaches you know, film. 
at at Seton Hill too. So he, right. you know what I mean? Like he really knew his stuff. <laughs> definitely, yeah. No, he was definitely very informed. Did he? Does he teach horror film? Yeah, I think like, so. I specifically. Think, oh, cool. I, uh, I think he teaches both. Uh, I'm not. I'm not 100 sure like what courses exactly he teaches, but um, I think I think he d- does film overall. But then I think he specifically also has courses about horror in general. Um, that is so cool. Yeah, I assume. Yeah, it would be cool. I'd love to take him. <laughs> uh, he's just a, he's a great person to learn from. So yeah, thank you for writing in, Mike. I really appreciate that. And that's the last one we got for a book that uh, to be adapted. Although uh, you know, Mike cheated a little bit there. Um, but that's something that I think we should try and answer. Uh, you, did you have a do you have a response for this? Yeah, I do have an answer. I, I don't know. I think you might find it really interesting. But I, I'd like to hear yours first because I went last time. Okay, that's fair. Fair enough. Yeah, I I have a lot of answers for this one. Um, I think in the past I said Head Full of Ghosts by Paul Tremblay, um, and I still stand by that. I think that would make it for a great adaptation. Um, but the one I'm going to go with right now is Jade City by Fonda Lee. Um, I think that that would make an awesome adaptation, right? Like I I can see a Netflix series. Like I think it would be so good. It's it's got kung fu and magic and you know, like Godfather, like family turmoil and, and it's just so cool. Right. And it's also kind of stylish and set in a certain sort of time period. I think it would look amazing. I think you bring in a visionary director who has like a style to them and they, they, they put it onto this, this material. And I just think it'd be great. And I really hope we see it, especially with Jade war coming out now. And I know Jade legacy, which is going to be the third book. Um, has been announced, um, although I know Fonda's still working on it. I think that this is made for an adaptation and it should absolutely happen. Yeah, definitely. I would love to know her her preference, like if she would like to see it as a miniseries or a TV show or... Yeah. Or, or sorry, like a miniseries or a film. Yeah. Uh, just because they're, they're totally different mediums, but I, I would love to see that. I would, I would watch the hell out of that show. All right, so what was your answer? So my answer is something that I don't remember if it holds up as well as I rem- remember it in my mind. But there's this book series called Pendragon. It's YA and it's it, the author's name is DJ McHale. And this was around the time that like, you know, I'd finished Harry Potter or I was like, you know, like up to whatever book was out, I had finished. And I was looking for other fantasy novels in kind of the same vein. And I, I find like just at my local library, I found this book that was like sitting out at, like a, as like a featured YA book. And I picked it up and just immediately wanted to read through the whole series. It's this so you know, there's this younger guy who finds out that his uncle is like some sort of like, like, um, shepherd or like basically like the, the main person for his world, his planet here. Mm -hmm. And there's, you find out that like, there's a flume that connects 10 different worlds. And, um, basically like each book can roughly be seen as like going to one of the worlds and solving a problem or, or helping, you know, the, the the people who are living there. But there's some interesting twists, like three of the worlds are, are one of them is like current Earth, one of them is like 1930s Earth, and the other one is like future Earth. And then there's all kinds of like crazy different like worlds with different kinds of creatures, cat Ooh. people and things like that. Anyway, this, it, it really captured my imagination when I was reading it growing up. Mm-hmm. And it started to get more mature, just like Harry Potter or something like that does as the books go along. And and it gets pretty intense. And I just remember loving it and just thinking like that's it was just made to be a TV show or a movie. That sounds cool, man. I'm not familiar with that at all. Um, but, but from you talking about it, I'm into it, man. Sounds good. Should be adapted. Um, I do have one other one I want to mention. Um, and so we talked, I think, on a bonus episode about how Love, Death and Robots on Netflix um, is made up of like adaptations of a bunch of short fiction right? It's not purely, I think there are a few original episodes in there, but a lot of them are these like mini episodes. A lot of them are very short. Um, they're adaptations of, of sci-fi fantasy material. I think a lot of sci-fi mostly. Um, and I want to put one propose one that I think should be adapted for an upcoming season. And that is the novelette by my viable paradise classmate, Simone Heller. Um, it is called when we were starless and it is an awesome Hugo-nominated novelette that uh, is up for the Hugo this year. And it's about this, like, lizard girl who is with this sort of um, tribe of other lizard people. And she's in this wasteland, and we're unclear what it is. And her thing she does is she goes around and she collects these ghosts. And these ghosts, we, we start to find out that these ghosts are actually, like, old technology 
and it's very like perceptive like um sorry the perspective of the of the protagonist impacts the way that you view this old technology and there's a lot of uh, rituals that this this little clan has come up with surrounding it and i won't spoil the story it's very good and i think that it would look really great in the style of that love death and and robots uh netflix thing i think it would be perfect for that that's cool yeah i i would love to read that that uh that that style too like there's there's so many different like animation styles basically for that love death and robots but i could see it almost any any of those styles i could see this this taking part in it would be cool all right so now we're on to our main event and that is we're going to figure out what the best adaptation of all time is uh we also asked people for their favorites so we should give the caveat that some people maybe they're just giving us their favorites maybe not they're giving us what they think is the is the best but isn't that kind of the same thing? Your favorite adaptation, isn't that kind of the one you think's best? I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we got it. We got a few for this one. So let's go ahead and start out. Hey, Luke. Hey, James. This is Sean from Stories of Your and Yours. My favorite book to film adaptation is a little thing called Jurassic Park. Now, this is probably showing my age a little bit, but that movie came out when I was 14 years old and hit me right in the sweet spot dinosaurs that looked more realistic than anything I'd ever seen, and it's Spielberg, so how could you go wrong? And then I found out that there was a book that the movie was based on, and I read the book shortly after I saw the movie, and I've never looked back since then. Little did I know I would read several more Michael Crichton books after that, and none of them would quite pan out the same way quality-wise in their movie adaptations the way Jurassic Park did. In fact, I would love to hear you guys do an episode on Congo, which I remember being a really good book, and then being horribly disappointed by the movie. And of course, there's a wealth of material I could dive into here about my thoughts on book-to-film adaptations, but this is not my podcast, so I'll keep it brief and just stick with another Crichton point. I would love to see a movie made out of Timeline. That's another one I read quite some time ago, but I remember being really good. Anyway, happy 100th episode. Keep up the great work, and here's to 100 more. Thanks for writing in, Sean. Uh, yeah, he, he, Story of Your and Yours is an awesome podcast. You should definitely check it out. He reads a lot of like public domain, older material, and also I think some uh, listener submissions. And he narrates them. And like if you couldn't tell from that clip, he's just got this great voice, right? And uh, he does an excellent job, puts a lot of production into it. I know I listened to The Telltale Heart uh, he did by Edgar Allan Poe. Quality, quality production. Uh, really cool stuff. So definitely check out that podcast. But yeah, thanks for writing in. And uh, do you know anything about this timeline by Crichton? That's one I didn't know about. I actually didn't know Congo was adapted off of a novel. Um, I've seen the movie, but uh, I didn't. I would be interested in reading that. And then, yeah, man, there's a lot to react to in there, I guess. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't know anything about timeline, but yeah. as far as Jurassic Park is concerned, how can yeah. you, you can't fault him for that being a favorite. That's like, what Absolutely. a what a adaptation that is what a film in general yeah we got to revisit the dino corner remember <laughs> was it the, the nine-year-old yeah. us <laughs> dino <Yeah>. corner. <laughs> i can't that was dude um, that was my whole life i i yeah. and i remember reading jurassic park before i could like like that was right around the time of harry potter for me like early harry potter stuff because of how much i love the movie mm-hmm. um so yeah great pick for a yeah. for good got a good adaptation for sure yeah absolutely an excellent one really uh one, one of the best and uh we had some great guests on for our episodes we did on it um i know that we want to cover lost world at some point um i don't know when that'll happen and maybe it'll depend on if people vote for it or not um i but i'm excited for it you know i i never read the book and so i'm really curious to know where the world goes in, in Crichton's universe versus what we see in the film and i think the difference could be really interesting to talk about so i'm into yeah. it uh so that's one vote for jurassic park <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, let's go ahead and get on to the next one. Hi, this is Sarah from North Little Rock, Arkansas, USA. At this moment, my favorite adaptation is the TV show Bosch, which is based on a series of books written by Michael Connolly. The show is set in modern day LA and it follows Iraq war vet turned homicide detective Harry Bosch as he solves multiple mysteries. And the showrunners get so much right. The mood and the tone are perfect. The cast is diverse and I don't have time to list the actors, but the acting is phenomenal. Also, the writing really fills in the holes on some of the secondary characters and makes them more three-dimensional. Oh, and the theme song is so cool. In my opinion, it's a nod to the book series because it's this modern song 
that has jazz elements to it. And Bosch in the book series is a fan of jazz music. And I think it's that attention to detail that really makes this adaptation stand out. Overall, it's really great storytelling, and I hope you check it out. Thanks. Bye. So I've heard great things about the show, actually. This was one of the one of the first big Amazon shows, I think. Like, this was one of their... They kind of hung their hat on this one for a long time. Um, it sounds really cool. Like, th- this idea of, yeah. like, a veteran coming back and, and becoming a detective and, you know, dealing with probably some of the stuff that he maybe saw overseas... Um, and yeah. bringing that back over and, and, and being a detective and having to deal with those at the same time. I can that definitely see cool, where that sounds cool, man. I, I yeah. know nothing about this. I don't know how it is that I've, I don't even think I've ever heard the name of this show. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah, I, I know nothing about it. And I hadn't, obviously, like I was the person who hadn't listened to that clip yet. So uh, that totally took me by surprise. I'm going to check that out now, though, because I like, um, I like a good detective story, you know, and, and yeah. especially if, if it's adapted from some quality source material. I'm into it, and and that sounds cool. That's a that's a really ringing endorsement. So you said it's on Amazon. I mean, yeah, I believe it's on Amazon. The cool. uh, Prime Amazon Prime Video. Sorry. Right, right, right. But uh, yeah, I uh, yeah, the idea of of a show like this being based on books, though, I feel like is really really strong stuff because a lot of times with these detective shows, you get lost in kind of the making the seasons work and and filling out 20 something episodes. But with a, with a clear storyline to tell, I think that that's a, that's a really strong reason to check out the show. Yeah. I'm definitely curious to know how, how much they do these like little episodic things versus like an overarching story. Cause I feel like whenever you're in detective stuff, like you're, you're going to get like a case of the week kind of deal, but maybe not in this one. I don't know. I'd be curious to find that out. Um, definitely going to look into that after this. Okay. And here's the next one. Hey, this is J.L. Gribble, author of the Steel Empire series. My latest book, Steel Shadows, came out on August 8th. My favorite adaptation is the television series The Expanse. Both the books and the show are near-future science fiction done right, with the perfect mix of the realistic and the fantastical. Even better, the show recognizes that visual storytelling is a different medium and adapts accordingly. Beltalada, and happy 100 episodes, Inktofilm. That's awesome. I so we talked about I think in a bonus episode, The Expanse is a project that um I like really 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 want to read. Um Leviathan Wakes, I believe is the name of the first book, and it's one of those that I actually had started but when we started the podcast and I never finished it because I knew that it could be a potential project. And uh we are currently planning the possibility of covering that later this year, maybe in advance of season 4, right? That's the season. Yeah. Um, so there's a chance we might be tackling book one. Um, I've heard nothing but good things. I've seen like one or two episodes. I was very into it, but once again, I stopped watching knowing we might cover it. So yeah, man, I'm excited for the expanse and, and that's cool hearing that. Yeah. I, I've heard nothing but good things as well. So I'm, I'm totally on board. Hopefully we can cover that this year so that I can watch all of it. <laughs> yeah. And, and J.O. Gribble, uh, by the way, a guest on our podcast way back when we covered a wrinkle in time. Um, so if you're curious about that, and you want to hear more from her, check those episodes out. Also, make sure to pick up her book, Steel Shadows, which comes out on August 8th. All right. And here's the next person's favorite adaptation. Hi, it's Jamie D. from Little Rock, Arkansas, USA. My favorite adaptation is the Mortal Instruments book series and the Shadowhunters TV show, not the horrible 2013 movie. With the exception of Jamie Campbell Bauer playing Jace, I prefer to pretend that movie didn't happen. I love the books because of the darkness of the world they built. I love the TV show Shadowhunters, which ran for three seasons on Freeform because the cast was outstanding. Alan Van Sprang as Valentine, Harry Shum Jr. as Magnus, and Isaiah Mustafa as Luke. I just couldn't stop watching even when the show gave me nightmares. I'm also not ashamed to admit I've cried every time I've watched, including several times today, Malik's wedding in the show finale. I could go on for days about my love for this adaptation and just cannot say enough good things about it. So Jamie mentioned the Mortal Instruments film. I'm pr- mm-hmm. I think I saw that movie. Okay. I'm pretty sure I, yeah. I think I saw it in theaters and yeah, I mm-hmm. remember not really enjoying it. I was hoping <laughs> that it was good though because I remember that there were a lot of people who were fans of the books and uh, the books have like really interesting covers that I was like, oh, maybe I'll read the books after I after I check this out. Um mm-hmm. But it sounds like they they made a freeform TV show as like an apology for that film. Really? Like they were like, we're we're so no. I'm just saying like it's, it's from what she's saying. Yeah. It sounds like they were like, we'll do it right this way, this time, and and they did it in the TV show. 
That's cool. I, I know nothing about this project. I've heard the name before, but um, I haven't seen the movie. I haven't seen the show. Once again, one um, I, I know a little bit more in that I know that that it is a, that it, that it is a book and and that it's you know an adaptation. But beyond that, I know very little about this. Well, let me tell you a little bit about this one. It's uh, in New York City. A seemingly ordinary teenager named Clary Frey learns that she is descended from a line of shadow hunters, half angel warriors who protect humanity from evil forces. After her mother disappears, Clary joins forces with a group of shadow hunters and enters Downworld, an alternate realm filled with demons, vampires, and a host of other creatures. Clary and her companions must find and protect an ancient cup that holds the key to her mother's future. And I think that might be the movie, but okay. I'm assuming that they're similar uh, in terms of plot. Cool. I mean, that sounds interesting to me, man. It sounds uh, like the sort of thing that we like, so... Um, I'm into it. Um, I'm definitely curious yeah. about this show and, and um, how, I wonder how many episodes there are and so on and so forth. Um, once again, it's like TV shows can be tough for us for scheduling, but I wonder if that's a project we might be able to tackle at some point. It could be cool. Yeah, it could be. You know what it kind of sounds like to me? Just And this is just me. It kind of, this from this description, kind of reminds me of like a Buffy type okay. show. I love Buffy, man. That's yeah, one of my like all-time favorite shows growing up especially. So, yeah, cool. I'm into it. Uh, Let's get to the next clip. Hi, I'm Wendy N. Wagner, and I think my favorite book-to-film adaptation has got to be Cloud Atlas, because I think the movie actually does a better job connecting all the characters across all the timelines. I still don't love all the wacky makeup effects, though. What I do love is Ink to Film, and I'm wishing them another 100 terrific episodes. Thanks, guys. So Cloud Atlas, uh, that is a blind spot for me. I've actually never seen the movie, never read the book. I know Tom Hanks is in it, uh, and it looked kind of interesting. I don't know how I missed this movie, honestly. Uh, But yeah, I mean, that sounds cool. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting movie. I I like how how large it is. It's a Wachowski's film, and they like really... They really went for it like they they I mean, it's not an easy story to tell on film. And I think they did a pretty good job. I know it got a lot of flack just I I couldn't say specifically why, but I actually really remember enjoying it. Yeah, I mean, Wachowski's that's cool. They always go for like those really, really big ideas like they shoot for the stars, you know, and so I give them credit for that. And 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 sometimes, you know, they maybe they don't quite get there, (laughs) but uh, they always they always really shoot for it. and, And, you know, hats off to them for that. Yeah, I th- it was a, it was a good morality tale. Like I think there was a lot wrapped up in it, and um, I mean it's it's definitely a damn a damn sight better than uh, Jupiter Ascending. I don't know if you saw that one. No, I did not. Uh, we should say that Wendy Wagner was a guest on our podcast in the past. Uh, she came on and helped us with the Shining uh, book episode, uh, and I think it was the third book episode. It was a really a lot of fun having her on. We we got to talk about Stephen King. It was really cool. So check that out if you want to hear more from her. Um, she's got several books out. I know an oath for dogs is on my shelf. Um, I need to read it. I haven't, you know, because of the podcast, I haven't gotten to it yet and which, uh, so hard, but, um, you know, she's great. You should definitely check out her writing and yeah, if you want to hear more from her, listen to that episode. Yeah. Thanks to Wendy. All right. Let's listen to another one. Hi, this is Chris from the Rocky mountains. The snow is all melted and I'm on the lookout for Mr. Torrance. Can't find him yet. My favorite adaptation is The Lord of the Rings. I think Peter Jackson brilliantly brings to life the father of all modern fantasy. And Helm's Deep is still the best fight scene ever put on film. Game of Thrones has nothing on Helm's Deep. Congrats to Luke and James on 100, and here's to many, many more. Thank you for being entertaining each and every week. I think uh, Chris has taken a little shot at me there with the the two towers point. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's got a point, man. I think he's I think he's spot on. Yeah, I mean, I, I I agree that it's better. I don't know necessarily agree if it looks better, but regardless, uh, a vote for uh, the Lord of the Rings as being the best adaptation. I think he's wrapping all three movies together, which makes sense. Um, that's a solid choice, and uh, you know. We appreciate Chris. He's been a supporter for a long time. Definitely thank you for writing in, man. And I, I have to say I agree with you, man. The, the uh, <laughs> Helm's Deep is still the best battle. Uh, it, and uh, in terms of, a, of an adaptation, Fellowship of the Ring, it, I'm, I'm right there with you. That's That's got to be like one of my favorites of all time by far. Yeah. So that's, that's a solid vote for that one. Okay, and we do have one more listener clip to play, so we're going to start that now. 
Hank, the Film Podcast. Jeremiah Dylan Cook here from NewPulpTales.com. I just wanted to congratulate you guys on 100 episodes. As the hobbits would say, may the hair on your toes never fall out. I'm looking forward to 100 more episodes with even more Stephen King and horror adaptations. Keep up the great work, guys. Well, I'm glad that you're looking forward to Stephen King adaptations because there's no shortage of those. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be covering a lot more of those in the future. Yeah, for sure. And I also do eventually want to get to The Hobbit, even though I uh, might have some uh, you know, not positive things to say about those films. We'll see. But uh, I'm still, I love that book, so I'm excited to get to that for sure. Yeah, I love that book as well. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for sending that in, man. I think that's all the clips we have, though, for the favorite adaptation. So I think it's about time we start getting into ours. Now... We decided we are going to break this up a little bit. We're not just going to straight up answer what's the best adaptation of all time. Because honestly, whenever I get asked that question, I always kind of follow up with like, well, what do you mean by that? Because I think there there are, there are different things people mean depending on, you know, who they are and what, what, what you know, uh, what interests them in adaptations. I think one question is, what uh, what is the most accurate adaptation right like it it, like because a lot of people when they say what's the best that's what they mean they're like which one really captured the book or the source and then put it on screen like that's a great adaptation right and that doesn't necessarily mean like plot for plot every single moment the same but it's in terms of like the spirit and like the the overall like what the artist was intending with the story was it brought over with the film as well yeah so that's one um i think that also people sometimes mean like you took something that was one thing and you changed it and you truly adapted it and you made something just incredible that like uh, is is amazing. Maybe it's maybe the original uh, source is, is amazing, too. But this new thing is amazing. And it's truly like a like a reimagining and an adaptation in that regard. Right. Like a, almost a different different definition of adaptation. And I think that's one way to look at it. And then I think another way that I think is fun, and I often get asked this, is what movie was better than the book? So in that sense, like, improved the source material, took something that was one thing and just elevated it to a whole nother level. And in that gap of, like, quality, sometimes I think that's what people mean when they're asking, like, best adaptation, because it took something and it just elevated it to a whole new level. And that's the, yeah. and I think all three of those things are kind of different answers. And I have different responses to each of them if I were to try and choose. Um, and, and so that's what we set out to do. We set out to try and answer each of those. Um, and I'm excited to hear what you chose, man. We haven't shared these with each other. Um, but we're, we're gonna, we're gonna get into that now. And then maybe we can put this to rest for, for once and for all. (laughs) (laughs) So we've kind of already answered this question before. The reason we broke it up instead of just giving one answer, we've kind of already given, um, based on like the projects that we covered in some of our last looks episodes, we've talked about like what our favorites have been. So we figured it would be a fun way to uh, to kind of break it up in this way. So yeah. do you want to start with... This will include with... things we haven't covered, potentially, or it could include things we haven't covered. The one thing that we decided to do, I should put this caveat out there too, is we only considered movies that we had read the book for. There are several, um, I should go ahead and say, like Arrival, like uh, Silence of the Lambs. Um, there's several of these things. Okay, so I have one here as well, actually. Um, one Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest right. uh, is one that I've never read the book for, but I'm sure, the, I'm, I, I, without even reading it, I know that it's going to be a great adaptation because I've seen the film. Yeah. Um, another that came up was The Maltese Falcon, which is a great yeah. early, you know, I think it was the 40s, yeah. like a great 40s film that I didn't know was based on a book, but I'm yeah. sure it's a great adaptation of whatever that. So I don't know if originally. I finished saying it, but basically we're not considering those movies because we right. haven't read the source. So we decided like, we're going to, we're going to, those are basically disqualified from our discussion because they're blind spots for us. Essentially like arrival is an amazing movie. I've never read the short story. I'm planned to as soon as we cover it. And that might shake up this list a little bit, but for now we're focusing on what we know for these, for these responses. Um, which one do you think we should start with, man? Which which of these three do you think we should tackle first? I think best representation, like best... Um, like accurate, like really accurate, captured. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I think I went first last time. So I think let's bounce to you. I don't think this is going to come as any surprise because this is my answer when somebody asks what the best adaptation is. Just in general, it's my my kind of go-to and I've talked about it on the podcast before. But I, I, I agree with Chris. As far as a representation... Of, a, of an adaptation i think fellowship of the ring is is the representation of a book that was adapted um it just is it captures everything that tolkien was trying to and and you know 
I think in some ways elevates in some ways it's not quite as good, but it's right there with it. Yeah. Uh, man, you got any runners up you want to, you want to name or you just want to go with that? No, for that one, I just have that one. That's it. Stands alone. That one's clear for me. Uh, man, I, I'm hoping this isn't going to happen every time, but I agree with you. That was my choice too. fellowship of the ring and really the whole, the whole, the whole trilogy, but especially fellowship of the ring just really captures that, that series and that book. Um, I, w- I do want to give a special mention. I, a couple, a couple of them jumped out too. And I think, um, the Martian, an episode we covered at the start of the year, I think that's a really great capturing of the essence of what that book was. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like they had to change it obviously because they had to like back off on some of the math and reimagine a few things, but the tone, how fun it was, Mark Watney's voice, like a lot of that just really came through in the movie. And I think it's a really accurate representation of that book. Um, yeah, and it didn't back off the math too much. You know, it's still it, it still right. went there. It's it still, for a film it like it was, was still like a, technical. It was still you know yeah. accurate. And it was still a fuck ways. yeah science kind of kind of movie, right? Right. Which is what's what the book was. It was perfect. Um, also, I want to I want to throw this one at you and tell me what you think. How do you? What about Harry Potter? What about the first Harry Potter? Because I, I mean, felt like yeah. that like, as far as like an accurate right, like because I felt like it really did capture that first book, right? Yeah, I don't. I don't think there's any any debating that. I think that it was spot on. Um, yeah. You know, and I think J.K. Rowling had had involvement in it, and maybe that's part of the reason. Yeah. All right, and one other one, I just got to shout it out. I know I'm giving a lot of answers here. My answer is Fellowship, but shout out to Good Omens. That did a really yeah. good job, man. As far as like an accurate, like it felt like that book did. Right. That was and fun. That's a, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, again, that's I think Neil Gaiman having his hands all over that was. I mean, showrunner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, that and that was uh, so much fun to cover. Um, fairly recent project for us, and and yeah, I just wanted to give that to give that one its due. I'm sure there are other ones that I'm maybe not thinking about, but that those were my answers. Fellowship, though, that's number one. Yeah, I miss those characters. I would love to to have some more from Crawley and Azir Fail. <laughs> yeah unfortunately i don't think it's going to happen but there's always a chance um <laughs> let's get on to the next one man so what do you what do you think let's save um let's save the 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 changing of the book and and let's instead focus on something that improved the source right okay um so this so, one was a bit harder yeah yeah so we we do have different answers for each of these and they sound somewhat different i think they are i mean they sound somewhat similar i think they are different right right so maybe talk about your process of choosing it too a little bit. So for this, I'm very specifically looking at where the book stood in my mind and where the film stood in my mind and the gap in between there. So how yeah. much of a difference was there? It's not necessarily that the book was bad or the movie was bad. I guess the movie would have to be good, but um, yeah. it's not necessarily that. It's just the the gap between them is, is pretty large. That space, um, yeah. And so that's kind of how I was able to finally come to a conclusion. I do have two answers for this one, but one is my very specific answer and one is kind of okay. just my backup. Well, give me the runner up first. Okay. The runner up for, for myself, as far as the best improvement on a book was, was Blade Runner because you're taking, uh, do Android stream of electric sheep and then making Blade Runner out of that. And the, like the stylized nature of it and just that film in general is just like so iconic and so, uh, I mean, it's a it's a huge pedestal. It's on a huge pedestal for me. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, so but that's not your primary answer. It's not my primary. Do you have multiple answers? Do you want to go and then I'll give you my real one? Oh, you want to bounce back and forth a little bit? Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So let me look and see here. My. Okay. Yeah. My runner up. I actually have two runners up. I'll just give them to you both real quick. I, I couldn't decide between it. these two. So my two runners up were Doctor Strange Love, recent project we just did, which was based off a of Red Alert. Um, obviously very different, but I think, uh, as far as distance, right? Like that, that book wasn't bad, but it wasn't an icon like this movie became. And then, uh, similarly the Godfather, um, that's my other runner up. It was just, uh, I mean, the distance between the book and the movie is pretty dramatic. It's one of the greatest movies of all time. And, um, the book was fun and it had a lot of really solid, like the character was there. Um, you know, it was, it was good. It also had a lot of weird moments that I'm really glad didn't make it into the movie. Um, but yeah, I, th- those, those are my two runners up. So your your one of your runner ups is my, is my actual answer. So the Godfather okay. That's in it. terms of, in terms of distance is like, it's unfathomable. It's, we're talking about a film that changed cinema landscape for the next like, you know, 50 years and is still seen as one of the greatest movies of all time. 
uh, between the first two parts. Uh, it's just the, the distance there is like, I think the original was like a pulpy fun book. And then you got one of the, the greatest, most um, epic tales of all time on film. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm totally with you, man. That's why. I, and honestly, this is one where I almost had to throw a dart because I, I really was kind of struggling. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to hit you with one that maybe won't come as a huge surprise. And, and it's really comes down to the distance in the book again. Um, and that is Die Hard. Um, one of my favorite movies. I know it's not a, it's an imperfect movie um, in many ways, but I just love that movie. And uh, reading that book, it's just it's just way it's you know there's a reason nobody knows it was adapted from a book and it's not that it completely I, shit on the novel it wasn't awful but man it's just night and day different from the film that we got and so as far as we're talking about just distance um die hard is a classic oh, action movie as far as like uh, you know you're talking about the effect it had on the industry i would argue die hard had an enormous effect on the industry after that movie came out and it did it, it did as well as it did really really good stuff and that's like the 80s like action film you know Absolutely. like that's that that continued forward for a long time and you still see those little action movies trying to yeah. fall in the footsteps of die hard now i still but, watch um, it every year man like yeah. and how many movies are there out there that i can say that about and and right. I, I just yeah a special place in my heart so i got so, i had to give it to die hard i had i had die hard on my list at one point and i also had another one that we covered on on the list they're both very similar boats for me speaking of boats it was jaws yeah um jaws and and die hard were right there for me and i was like the only reason is because I see Blade Runner and Godfather as farther, farther beacons than than Die Harder or uh, Jaws. Which Jaws, that's saying something that that Jaws isn't, doesn't quite reach there because that film's incredible. Yeah. All right, and man. So I, I, the more we're talking about it, I am seeing some overlap between our other ones, but there is, I think, a small distinction here. So when we talk about the best reimagining of a book, we're talking about like the the process of taking something and. And, and pulling up parts of it that you want and leaving parts behind you don't want and and maybe even changing the parts you took to have them mean something else. And you're really just like reimagining this whole story and putting uh, putting it into film. And that adaptation process, I think, is like maybe at the heart of what people mean when they ask what's the best adaptation, right? I don't yeah. know. Depends on the person. Anyway, so so I have a few answers for this, but then I, I ultimately force myself to choose one in particular. Uh, do we want to give some runners up first? I think we should do that. I, I just have one for this one, just because it okay. was so it was so relevant to me as far as like reimagined. Okay, go ahead. I am a little worried that you chose it as well. Now that we've, <laughs> sorry, don't worry about. <laughs> Maybe you should have coordinated <laughs> a little bit, but um, no, it's better this way. My reimagined is is something that we covered: Annihilation. Yes, that's a good one. Yeah, it was not my choice. It's, but uh, it was it's yeah. it's so and, and i enjoy both of them there's not a huge gap between them like it's not like a best improvement no, or anything true. like that there's not a huge gap but both are fantastic but the re- reimagined version of annihilation I never could have predicted that in a million years and it, it gave me something truly interesting and alex garland like he was already on my list of people that i've watched anything he puts out but you know the bank the one two punch of of ex machina and then annihilation just like i'm, I'm watching anything he puts out yeah, man, that's a good choice. That's a solid choice. This is one that I really struggled with. I have a lot of answers, um, but let's just focus on a couple of my runners up. So I'm, I'm going to give you two. So one, House Moving Castle, looking way back. Um, I really enjoyed that novel, but we lo- you look back at that novel, and in the ha- about halfway point, about the midpoint, it takes a dramatic turn, and it changes the story. And so in adapting it, Miyazaki was able to, 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 to shape it into a story that fits his vision and the stories that he likes to tell, right? And, and I think that process of changing it and putting it into the movie we got um, shows, shows that it's a, a, just a great adaptation. Um, it's not quite my number one, but it's right there. And then the other one, once again, not quite my number one, but right there, Blade Runner. Um, that's one that you, you mentioned before, but I, I really, I really like Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. Um, but it was a different book. It was, a, it was about something different in a way, even though both at their heart are about like what it means to be human. Um, beyond that, um, there's a lot of differences when you start looking at these two things and comparing them. And I think the process of adapting that into, into film was, was really something else. Um, yeah, man, that was almost my number one. Really, it's like one A, one B, but I'll, I'll go with that as a runner up. You ready to give me your, cool. your number one choice? Annihilation was my number one choice. 
That's it, man. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. I thought you had a runner-up yeah, for that ahead. one. My bad. Um, so let me give you my number one choice then. And this might come as a surprise to you. It is The Shining, um, which which is funny because we covered that and we talked about it. And I ultimately said I liked the book better, right? And we right. came down on You said you liked the movie better. Um, but that's not what this is about. This is about the adaptation itself as a great adaptation. And I think it was because of this, right? Like it was Kubrick's reimagining of the story and changing. I mean, some of it was subtle things, but some of it was major things and, and changing characters and changing format to make a different, slightly feeling movie than the book we got. And, um, and then once again, it just, the, for being like such a landmark movie and so iconic and something that's just so remarkable, um, I think that's one of the best adaptations of all time for that reason. Yeah. I mean, I can't fault you for that. I, I definitely think that that's completely true. I, I honestly I didn't even think about The Shining when I should have. Yeah. I mean, it's I, part of it is, it, it, I mean, a lot of it is very similar, but there's a lot that was changed too, right? Like in that sense, it was a true adaptation of, of a reimagining in a lot of ways. So um, yeah, that's my answer, man. Um, now that we've settled it, we put it to bed. We can never get asked that again. <laughs> <laughs> no, this this is an ongoing thing, right? Like this is something that we talked about beforehand. I, I think this ultimately, what's my favorite adaptation is a question that I am chasing and that I one of the things I love about this podcast is it gives me a chance to explore that and to try and find out what the answer to that is. Um and I'm excited to go forward into the next 100 episodes, you know, trying to find out what is my favorite adaptation. I think that's an ongoing yeah. question. Yeah, I was really excited when we covered uh, Children of Men, like how how much Children of Men in your mind changed. Yeah, and man, I think I that's almost, part of the fun is yeah. just just like revisiting these movies that maybe you you have seen but don't like really, really remember. Um, I think it's just such a such a nice opportunity to be able to, to really dig down and see like yeah. what is the, you know, the best adaptation or, or what is a great adaptation or or notice things maybe you didn't notice before. Yeah. And, and you know, connecting with our community, it sounds sappy, but the little bit of a community we're starting to build and we hope that it continues to grow. I've learned things about adaptations from them. I've, you know what I mean? Like it, it's been really cool to, to, to see that starting to, to starting to build. Um, and I'm excited to see where that goes going forward. So I, we're not going to do a lot of self promo here at the end of this episode. Like we normally do. We'll save that for next time. But um, yeah, thank you so much for listening and uh, we really appreciate it. Make sure if you're going to if you're going to do the Patreon thing, you got to sign up by the 11th. So make sure to get on that quick. Otherwise, um, it's been a pleasure. Um, Cheers to you, man, on 100 episodes. I wish I could share that scotch with you tonight. (laughs) (laughs) Cheers to you, man. Yeah. All right. Until next time. Thanks for listening. Oh, no, you're supposed to hit me with a new with a new catchphrase. Oh, right. Sorry. Until next time, Bazinga. <laughs> <laughs>